Greetings, everyone. Greetings from Istanbul. As the Center for Ottoman Malay World Studies for today's program, we are honored to have the company of the leading historian of the Southeast Asia, Professor Anthony Reid. I often briefly introduce the guests, but since the academic circles in this field are very familiar with the professor, I would like to spare time to listen more from him and skip the introduction part. Welcome, Professor Ray, and thank you for accepting our invitation today. Welcome. Nice to be here. Thank you, Professor. So, Dr. Mehmet Azai, please, floor is yours. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or uh, good evening. Um, uh, Prof. Uh, Professor uh, Anton Reid, welcome to our program and the dear audiences uh, from different parts of Turkey, probably from Southeast Asia and uh, some people from Europe. Uh, thanks uh, for your being over here. Um, today we have a guest, uh, he is a renowned scholar, uh, scholar of Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, he has been uh, in the field since uh, the beginnings, probably 1960s onwards. And I believe that this is a greater opportunity for the students uh, of Southeast Asian studies and the academics researchers in the field to hear some important issues uh, pertaining to the regional studies uh, from an expert. Uh, the expert of uh, uh, means that uh, Anton Great. He has been uh, producing numerous uh, academic works uh, since the second part of the 1960s, as I mentioned. Uh, when we look at the scopes of uh, Anton Braid's papers, books, uh, he is not only a historian in a sense, but probably we can call him as social scientist in a total sense. Uh, so in fact, in a short talk, uh, 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 which will take probably uh, one and a half hours or two hours uh, maximum, will not be enough to cover in details uh, the issues which we will uh, highlight. But uh, we believe that uh, Mr. Anton Braid will draw a general view uh, for the audiences, uh, how we should deal uh, with the history of Southeast Asia. And uh, this uh, region is a geography which has uh, own physical limits. But when we look at, uh, uh, look at it in a larger scope, both intra-regional and trans-regional connectivity have made it very dynamic throughout the historical stages, including today. Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, this region is an entity uh, by itself composed of two general dimensions, such as insular and peninsular or Indochina regions in connecting part. On the other hand, uh, in the course of history, uh, this region has become an attractive geographical zone for different nations from east to west, commencing from the guests, uh, traders, uh, scholarly circles from India and China. Uh, we will highlight some issues uh, in this talk, um, such as uh, geography, history, uh, myth and reality, uh, social change, reconstruction, so on, probably, but uh, general uh, sense. So uh, as we guess that uh, history, uh, we can consider it as a social uh, science, uh, use some uh, certain uh, general uh, methodologies such as uh, comparative method cause and effect relationships. Uh, but uh, as we see in the field, it, based on, it bases on uh, the data, which is probably a periodic, we can say very limited, uh, very uh, less, uh, very less uh, informative or uh, probably uh, mixed with uh, mythology, mythology so on. So it also uses interpretation uh, as a method. Uh, there are human agencies, as we guess, as actors throughout history who uh, construct and reconstruct the historical relationships. But at the same time, there are some historical forces such as uh, natural disasters, wars, etc., to give direction to some of larger extent to the historical relationships. And we see even today. Uh, in, in, in regional and global politics, Southeast Asia still uh, are on the stage uh, uh, in terms of uh, economics, in terms of politics, international relationships. So in this context, I would like to uh, highlight uh, my first question uh, to Mr. Anthony Ray. Uh, as a, an introductory question, uh, I would like to highlight geography. Um, uh, Mr. Anton Reid, where is Southeast Asia? Uh, where does uh, the border begin 
and end as there being a static border in historical development and stages, or has the, have these boundaries narrowed or expanded throughout various processes? Um, so probably uh, referring to one of your works, how can you chart the modern or early pre-modern uh, early Southeast Asia? Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, it's, it's a good question. Of course, it's always a, a beginning question. And um, Southeast Asianists tend to be a bit on the defensive sometimes um, because uh, they don't have a great power in their, in their midst, as it were, um, which in a sense makes East Asia more uh, prominent in, in world awareness and South Asia because of Indian culture, Chinese culture. Uh, but of course, by the same token, ASEAN, uh, just because it doesn't have a great power dominating civilization, it works. It works much better than um, those rather unequal uh, blocks that we see in um, uh, East and South Asia. But uh, I mean, the answer to the question, I think, is, is two. I mean, firstly, yes, environmentally, I think it's, it's important that Southeast Asia is a region. I, I mean, fundamentally, I, I have argued that it's, it's the environment that makes the material culture, you know, the sort of rice agriculture system, the manner of living, the manner of eating, the manner of dressing, you know, that, that makes for the commonality, uh, that it's a wet, hot place. I mean, it's, it's the humid tropics. Uh, and, and it, it does have boundaries um, in the ocean to the west and, and, uh, and the south and the, um, the mountains of uh, uh, what um, Jim Scott calls Zomia, the kind of stateless areas of the highlands, which China found uh, difficult to cross. Uh, so, I mean, in, in that sense, I think it does cohere as a region, even though I mean, the the disunity, the diversity is, is, is palpable. And of course, everybody now, since uh, religion, religion has, formal religion has become so important, thinks of Islamic Southeast Asia is quite different from Buddhist Southeast Asia and so forth, and Christian Southeast Asia. Yeah. But um, I mean, in the, in the long durée the, of, of history, these are actually rather recent uh, um, identities that have become very salient. But the other thing I want to say is, I mean, which you hinted, I think, about the changing borders. I mean, in particular, uh, the, the border with China has, as you can say, moved as China has moved south. I mean, the uh, part of my, my most recent book, the history, the general history, where I try to set the stage at the beginning, I make something of Southeast Asia being not China, not India, um, although it has been confused with both or, or uh, uh, seemingly penetrated by, by both at different times and, and in different degrees. Um, with India, of course, I mean, you know, for, for long, Filipinos were called Indios and, and Indonesians were called Indias. I mean, the, the region was thought to be part of India in, in that sense by, by Europeans. Um, and, and of course, the cultures, uh, India exported many things about religion and ideology and alphabets and, and, and writing systems. Um, but there is quite a big lump of ocean between India and Southeast Asia, which, which has, you know, has made it uh, never part of India, never could be part of India. Uh, with the China case, there's been, I mean, the, the peoples of Southeast Asia had their origins in, in what we now call China. I mean, and they arrived often, um, the, the Austronesians, of course, from Taiwan only, only uh, um, three or 4,000 years ago. Uh, the Thais even only a thousand years ago moved south um, from um, southern, what is now southern China, as the Chinese state expanded. And uh, so in a sense, the insofar as Southeast Asia is not China, that, that is not a place of 
a strong bureaucratic state and a strong written culture. Um, and Southeast Asia has always been that. Uh, it mattered where the border of China was. And of course, Vietnam became critical in, 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 in contesting that space as to where the southern boundary was because, China, because Vietnam was sinified uh, for a thousand years, was, was occupied by Vietnam. It, it acquired some of the tools of China, of, of a strong state, uh, the Confucian examination system, you know, a, a bureaucracy open to talent, all these very modern phenomena that, that China um, had the advantage of, which made it able to resist um, China. So that the China-Vietnam border is the only, in a way, the only stable border there is in Southeast Asia, is because both sides of the border thought in bureaucratic territorial terms uh, that, that we need a border because uh, elsewhere the, the borders are, are always fluid. I mean, until the modern, the modern era and the introduction of colonial borders. Um, but yes, I, 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 I think, um, I mean, we, we always say Southeast Asianists that the, the coherence of, of Southeast Asia is its diversity, which is a bit, you know, you might say it's a bit perverse to insist on, on that contradiction. Um, but there is much in it that, that within each Southeast Asian society there has endured until very modern times a high degree of internal diversity. For example, between upland and lowland people. I mean, that, uh, I mean that's in a way more fundamental than the, uh, the gulf between Thai Buddhists and, and Javanese Muslims. Um, um, that, that everywhere there, there have been these peoples who, who resisted incorporation into any kind of state uh, until the colonial 20th century state. Um, so, I mean, that, um, that kind of um, diversity is, is not just between states, but it's, it's within uh, all the states. And so that they have minorities and, and, and uh, um, ethnic complexity is, is part of the scene. And of course, that they have Chinese and, or Indian immigrants, which again creates this common diversity, I mean, if, if you can uh, put it that way. Yeah. No, I can't hear you, sorry. No, I can't hear you. Uh. Excuse me. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Reid. Um, you are a closer uh, uh, observer and a witness to the region since uh, from your uh, young uh, uh, ages because of a son of a diplomat. Uh, he spent some early years in Indonesia, Jakarta, um, and, and then became a scholar in the University of Malaya. Um, um, when you look at this uh, more than half century, um, what have you been uh, observing the changes uh, in terms of understanding of history of the region uh, then in 60s, 70s, and probably beginning, uh, starting uh, from the beginning of this uh, century? Are there some uh, ups and downs uh, of, of understanding of the region and history or some continuities uh, we can uh, assume uh, uh, there are? Please welcome. Um, well, thank you. It's um, I'm not sure quite how to how to tackle that. Uh, I mean, whether it's I mean, I have changed over these 50, 60 years, and the region has changed, and the region's historians have changed. Um, but perhaps perhaps I can tell it to some extent through my own experience. So. My generation was a post-colonial generation. I mean, we were still very anxious to decolonize. That was the big deal. And that was, and I think, I think particularly so for people in Australia and New Zealand, where like Southeast Asians, we discovered after 1945 that actually we were independent separate countries. We weren't British. That was some sort of um, imaginary that we, we 
we played out for, for that our parents still were very ambivalent about. But my generation was quite convinced that was nonsense and that we belonged in this region. And so um, shedding uh, their colonialism was also like shedding our colonialism. I mean, of course, we didn't have to fight for it in the way they did, but, but it, it was important for us to identify with South East Asia because, and, and with the anti-colonial uh, struggle in history as in, as in politics. Um, so, uh, I mean, I wrote a, a thesis which was, which was a sort of boring um, documents, you know, from, from foreign policy documents in the British um, um, Public Record Office. Um, uh, but I, I found I could get quite excited myself about, you know, the uh, telling the story of the underdog, of a small place, Aceh, struggling against the superpowers of the day and trying to be itself and, and, and to resist absorption into what became Indonesia. Um, so, I mean, I thought no, that's the story I told. And as I said, it, it, and like most PhD theses, you know, a few people read it and a few people patted me on the back, it's not bad, but you know, it wasn't. But I, I was totally astonished to find in the 1970s that our Chinese who were fighting for independence got very excited about it. And uh, one wrote to me saying, you know, uh, guerrillas in the hills have a AK-47 in one hand and your book in the other. My boring thesis, you know, of all things. So, I mean, this, um, this, this frightened me. I mean, I, I, I felt, and I've always felt, you know, one, one doesn't know what the result of one's work is going to be. Um, I mean, of course, the last thing I wanted to do was to foment some sort of separatist uh, struggle and bloodshed and so forth. But I mean, what they liked was that I told the story of a, a small sultanate, uh, small and messy sultanate, but trying to play on the world stage, trying to find, you know, alliances with the United States or Turkey or or uh, France or whatever, and um, act like a proper proper uh, modern state. So they found that very exciting. And, um, but I suppose that's, oh dear, uh, continue, okay. Um, that, that's just a, 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 an aside really to, to illustrate what happened about nationalism. I mean, I suppose that in general, my, my generation of historians like the Southeast Asians themselves of that generation, but less intensely, we sympathized with nationalism. We, we thought, you know, this is, the, this is the exciting new thing and it's throwing out the, the, the wicked colonialists that we, we, we wanted to escape from, that we, we identified with our parents' generation and, 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 and all those things we we're trying to escape from. But um, nationalism, is of course a, a dangerous uh, sort of drug. And um, Chinese nationalism, of course, is, became the opposite of Indonesian nationalism. Uh, I mean, they both were extremely intolerant of each other. Um, and uh, of course, those of us who watched from outside became perhaps disillusioned with nationalism more fully than those inside, but those inside have also gradually, uh, more gradually become, uh, I mean, the next generation just didn't share the generation of people my age who, who even though they were disappointed that things didn't work out, that as they hoped that we had military dictatorships, we had um, uh, Islamic extremism, we had, um, um, the restoration of, of absolute monarchy in, in, in uh, Thailand and, and so forth. 
we had all these things that we didn't expect, uh, but um, they didn't, they never quite lost the faith in the way that their children did. Um, so, um, but in the, I mean, I suppose that I, I have found myself very bothered by, in particular, the way the Indonesian nationalist history developed. I mean, in a sense, it worked. It worked to take a very simplified uh, common theme. Uh, I mean, in, in, in brief, um, you know, Indonesia was a very diverse place. How are you going to create a, a sense of togetherness? The, uh, the nationalist leadership, and particularly when it came to be a military uh, dominated one, um, took the, the simple line of, of saying, well, the common element is that we all hated the Dutch. I mean, so that we could all have a common enemy and that can unite us. And so you had this rather extraordinary uh, definition of history that if you, if you weren't anti-Dutch, then you really weren't proper Indonesian. So everybody had to somehow find heroes. I mean, they, they have officially declared uh, ever since Sukarno's time, the Pahlawa Nacional, a national hero was like a, a saint in the Catholic church, you know, something that has to be go through all various committees of, uh, is this, are they qualified? Are they, were they completely 100% anti-Dutch or did they, did they um, diverge from this at times? Um, but so those for whom the, the heroes were those who were on the side of the Dutch against their other enemies, they were in a very problematic position, like the, the boogies have this problem um, in Sulawesi. Um, so it, it was very, uh, a very brittle um, and undernourished vision of what the past was about. And it meant, I think, that young Indonesians didn't really want to engage with anything that happened before 1945, because it was, it was in this difficult language that nobody wanted to learn anymore. Um, and it, it, besides, it was, it was the bad guys. So, um, I mean, in, in some ways, it, it has been a major problem for Indonesia in knowing what it is. But on the other hand, in a sense, it, it, it has worked. I mean, this, this is something maybe we'll come back to. The, the post-revolutionary um, formula um, of Indonesia, in contrast, let's say, with the evolutionary formula of, of Malaysia or, or Thailand or other places, has um, created a kind of blank slate. Uh, it has negated the past, as revolutions do. I mean, that is really what matters most, I think, about it, revolutions, that they they negate the past, and so you don't have to you don't have to worry about all that baggage, all that heritage. You're worried about the future, um, and. Uh, you know, we're going to make a new a new place here, and this this happened to all the revolutionary uh, regimes that regimes that came into power through revolution, like China, Cambodia, or Vietnam, or or Indonesia, um, and um, they wrote instead of the rather you know extraordinarily rich and diverse history that they were heirs to, they wrote a rather narrow and um, brittle history, which wasn't really very interesting and wasn't really something that real people like their grandparents could make much sense of. It, 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 uh, I mean, they didn't really want to go back to the local locality. I, um, I remember going to this small island of Nias off the coast of Somalia, which has an amazing culture. And I was, I was as a you know, zealous young historian, I, I was trying to find somebody to tell me about the history. So I found the, the high school, the, the most senior school, they didn't have a university. And I talked to the history teachers and I said, oh, this place, it doesn't have a history. No, there's no history. So we don't teach anything about this place. 
because uh, I mean, this is a place with half a million people and you know, totally distinctive culture because they don't have a, a national hero, Pahlavi Nacional. Therefore, they don't have a history. So there's nothing that's authorized as part of this, this narrative that, that enables different places to be part of the narrative if they have a, a genuinely anti-Dutch hero that's been officially credited as a hero and therefore can go in the textbook. So, um, I mean, that's, that's, that's saddening. Um, and of course, younger historians are, are, are um, I mean, not that much, the next generation, in fact, the children of, of my generation, um, weren't impressed with this and have, have written much more uh, um, much more rich and textured histories. But I think that that whole uh, way that's developed mean, means that Indonesians haven't been very interested in the past. They have been, you know, has worked in unifying and creating uh, a nation of Indonesians because they all had a common education now, the younger generation, and they knew nothing about the separate sort of histories of the different regions, but they knew this central thing. They had only one language. There was only one syllabus at the schools throughout, you know, from Sabang to Morocco. So um, in that sense, it has created a nation, um, as you might say, post-revolutionary France. I mean, they, they did the same thing. They, they imposed French language and, and a symbol, a, a single notion of, of what war is and what, uh, what the state is, and uh, became much more unified than, say, Britain. Um, so, um, but it has had the cons a consequence of making Indonesia not very interested in, in history. Uh, unlike, I think, um, Filipinos or, or Thais, who Vietnamese in their way, um, although that's also a revolutionary situation. Um, but uh, I mean, because of the monarchy in Thailand, because, because Spanish isn't so foreign for Filipinos as Dutch is, I mean, the, there's a sort of readiness to see that that Spanish period, partly because it wasn't the American period, you know, that's more us, you know, we're, you know, we're busy rejecting the American so we can embrace our Spanish heritage. So, I mean, those two kind of, I, no, I noticed there's just much more interest in history. Um, it hasn't, history has not flourished as a discipline in Indonesia, I have to say, I mean, in, in my time. And so the, the kind of hopes and expectations we had when I started out about how, you know, they, they would soon take over the field and people like me would be just, you know, observers of what, what that hasn't really happened they, uh, to the extent that, you know, we expected. Um, okay, uh, you, you say very important things. I mean, it is a uh, nation state building process after the uh, Second World War or the, the, the war uh, as known in the region Pacific War. Um, so the, 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 there is a certain uh, border uh, between these nation states, uh, newly emerging uh, nation state and the past of these multi uh, ethnic groups in, in the region. You gave examples from Indonesia. Um, the, but uh, this is also a sort of um, reconstruction of history throughout the lenses of these nation states and the powers of this uh, nation states. Probably I will turn back this issue later on, but uh, let me continue as a second part of this uh, question. I mean, uh, during 1960s onwards, uh, Southeast Asia, um, um, uh, each country in, in Southeast Asia deals much uh, internally uh, to unite themselves, um, uh, as you give example, Indonesia and the other parts also uh, uh, some sort of um, similar um, 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 political activities. But we see this uh, regionality uh, in the form of uh, probably we can start from Seattle uh, by the power of the United States, uh, 1957, if I'm not wrong, but it failed to uh, survive. And later on, 1961, ACA means that a situation of South Asia uh, by these three powers in the region. But the most important uh, stage of this regionalism uh, became a um, um, uh, concrete uh, uh, level by the establishment of ASEAN. So uh, ASEAN um, 
as some historians, uh, uh, political scientists, as mentioned, uh, this is a power block uh, to, to, to in front of the China, communist China. Uh, but later on, we see ASEAN became an entity. Uh, how do you uh, evaluate uh, the positioning of ASEAN uh, itself in 19, uh, let's say, early 70s, became, uh, because it became uh, relevant 1971? Uh, and uh, particularly after uh, the turning of this century, 21st uh, century till today. So the balance of, uh, of the powers uh, in, in regionality, ASEAN became something or still becoming uh, to be a sort of um, a power in the region. Uh, I, 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 I'm a bit surprised that you use the term power because it seems to me often in, in international relations discourse, ASEAN is seen as anything but powerful. It, 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 I mean, China is powerful, maybe Japan is powerful, India. But ASEAN nevertheless works um, uh, in the sense that because nobody dominates it, uh, because in a way the most effective player is like the smaller state, Singapore. And, um, you know, they, nobody can really uh, fear Singapore much, although, you know, they, they, they run around and write a lot of reports. Um, it, it, it has proved, I, I think, remarkably resilient as a, uh, a talking shop and a place, a forum, uh, also for Asia as a whole. I mean, because, because there's so many animosities in both East Asia and Southeast Asia and in between East Asia and Southeast and South Asia. Southeast Asia seems like um, a place that is less threatening to anybody. Uh, and it's, I mean, in a way, I, I think ASEAN very well reflects this idea that, you know, historically, Southeast Asians have made a virtue of this um, weak state, this managing almost without a state, and muddling through without clear um, bureaucratic uh, legal um, leadership or, or uh, obligation. Um, and now, I mean, this. It, it, it's easy to, to patronize this and say it's um, a place of many failures, you know, failure to quite develop the, 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 this. I mean, we think of strong states as, as, as successful and, and, um, and except for Singapore, really there are no strong states in Southeast Asia. They're, they're all rather messy states, um, though they've done quite well. For, for messy states, for, for states that don't, um, don't manage very well to um, impose their legal um, system on their populations. I mean, it, it's corruption is everywhere. Uh, the evasion of, of state control is everywhere. Um, and this has led to, to um, um, you know, a lot of literature about, you know, this, this kind of patrimonial system or, or a, um, uh, a weak state system. Um, but despite that, I mean, it's a bit, bit like Italy in Europe, you know, that it always seems to be a total mess and yet the economy does okay um, because there are other ways of managing things. And I think that's been the case um, in Southeast Asia, but it, I mean, it's, it, has, it has managed to uh, survive because uh, people have learned to be quite good at accommodating each other um, rather than bullying each other. Um, and, you know, people don't, re on the whole, people don't react well to, well, they don't react well to bullying anywhere, but, you know, some, uh, some governments have, have done it more effectively of, of, uh, of beating their populations into shape. 
Um, so there are strengths and, and weaknesses, but it's not it's not all weakness. This um, this uh, group of, of governments that um, are not are not uh, any of them except Singapore strong bureaucratic legal bureaucratic states. Um, but uh, if you compare them, let's say, with comparable states in Africa, as a colleague of mine, David Henley, has been doing a bit of that. And I mean, it's, it's astonishing just how much better they've done um, than African states, which seem to have some similar problems of relatively new and artificial states that um, are struggling to, to control their populations. Um, but despite that, um, you know, enormous economic progress has, has taken place. Um, so, I mean, it, it is, it's interesting that ASEAN has perhaps since it, as you say, in, in this century, since it, it's become a fact of the international architecture. So, um, the old debates that we Southeast Asians used to have about, you know, so, uh, examining our, ourselves and worrying about whether this place really existed or not, that, that's sort of gone away a bit. Uh, even while um, in some ways the things that divide the region have grown more pronounced. Um, and I mean, I mean, particularly religion, it, it, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it seems rather striking. And now, now that uh, religion, that formal religion, as opposed to the kind of everyday um, peasant religion, as it were, um, has become so uh, salient in, in all the societies, um, one might have expected, you know, the, the fissures to, the, 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 the cleavage between North and South to, to really break the thing apart. But um, that has never even looked like happening, um, which is interesting. Um, uh, I, think, I think Southeast Asians know deep down that they are rather similar societies, despite, despite these formal religious systems they adhere to, which, which make them very different. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Reed. Um, the next stage, I would like to uh, highlight the concept of history historian. Probably uh, some more of us would like to hear these concepts uh, from you. Um, this is your uh, field of interest and study uh, in the last uh, half century. Um, um, first of all, what is history? Uh, what does this field tell us? Or, uh, and who is the historian? Uh, what's the responsibility or task of, of a historian uh, uh, the others would like to, uh, him or her to perform? Um, and uh, to whom uh, uh, does history serve? If you consider this is a sort of yeah. uh, entity. So these uh, two uh, major concepts, history and historian, uh, generally, what would you like to yeah. tell us? Yes. Yeah, no, that's it's a very pertinent question. Um, and much, again, much has changed since I was a student. Um, it, the, the, in common sense terms, everyday terms, we are all fascinated by history. We all, we all want to know about the past. We all want to know what it is that created our world, you know, why are we the way we are, why are we, as we are, and so forth. Um, but that's seldom formed, especially nowadays, uh, seldom formed by historians. It's very widely now formed by uh, fiction and movies. I mean, and um, I, I'm not sure how it works in Turkey, but I'm sure there are certain episodes of Turkish history that had very emotive and colorful movies made about them. And people know a lot about those incidents and forget about the rest. I mean, the British are, are obsessed with Henry VIII and Elizabeth, you know, this Tudor period. And then they're obsessed again with World War II. And for a moment, they had this moment of glory uh, standing up against Hitler. 
and, and endless movies and, and coverage of this. Um, uh, but history as a discipline is, is a different thing entirely. Um, and it, it has actually a problematic history. It, 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 developed, it was not one of the first disciplines to emerge in, in the academy, um, but it did become very strong in the 19th century. Um, and uh, in, in Europe, but also elsewhere in, in Japan and China and so forth, it became um, a university discipline, but it was very complicit with nation building and nationalism. And uh, every, every nationalism, I think you can say, but it's, it's, it's particularly well documented in the European cases, required a, a national history to be created. Um, and some of those national histories were generous and, and uh, liberal and uh, concerned with the expanding rights of, of, of individuals and freedoms and so forth um, of the citizenship. Some were more concerned with uh, historical grievance and, uh, and racial um, uh, purity and, and, and so forth. Um, so there's all kinds of national history, but historians often did play quite a big role in, um, in a sense, creating the, the nation states that, that emerged in the 19th century. And then, uh, and then of course, in Asia, that the same process happened in the 20th century. Um, but um, so I, for me, that's, that's something to apologize for. And to, because I, I, I mean, Nationalism had its had its role. I mean, it, it was necessary, and um, nation states proved a very very successful uh, phenomenon. And so one can't uh, one can't uh, say that, uh, that that shouldn't have happened or mightn't have happened, but it did happen anyway. Um, but in the twenty first century, and even even the late twentieth, historians have have been rather concerned about that, uh, about the way in which this, the um, history was complicit with, with the rise of nation states and, and with their nationalism, but also with the, the state itself. And um, uh, for me, uh, that's also been a, uh, a worry increasingly. Um, and one sees it still in, I mean, in, in Asia, of course, it's, it's perhaps, even more intense a subject of, of um, uh, nationalist obsession. Uh, the conflicts between China and Japan, uh, between Korea and Japan, um, between Thailand and Laos, um, Thailand and Cambodia, Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, Burma and Thailand, of course. I mean, these are often played out uh, through history and, and often um, the, the different uh, sides are, are um, uh, encouraged um, by the, the, or have been in the past encouraged by the historians. So it, it seems to me the, the role of the, the responsible historian in our time has become very clear to, to um, rise above this, this problem, or if you like, undermine it from below, um, to, to insist on uh, histories which are truthful, honest, and global. I mean, that, that you know, humanity is uh, one, we have a very, fragile planet here to look after and uh, quarreling in these ways that have been so destructive in the past is the last thing that the planet needs um, uh, or our species needs. Uh, in, in. So 
I, I'm, I've become, I suppose, a, a, an enthusiast for global history in, in the sense that we should always write conscious of how our subject sits, not just in a national narrative, as if we didn't care what the people on the other side of the border thought, but that it's, it's always um, comparative, always uh, sensitive to different points of view uh, and different sources, different sorts of sources. Um, so I, I, have, I have managed to avoid writing a, any national histories. Many of my colleagues have, and often some of the better histories have arisen when somebody asked me to write one, and I always passed the buck and said, why don't you ask X? I, I, I can't do this. I, 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 um, um, I mean, the foreigners have written histories, and some of them have been very successful uh, and surprisingly influential. I, I tend to say, well, that's not for a foreigner to do. I mean, one can only either get into a fight with nationalism or um, or become complicit with it by by um, um, writing on a national basis. So I've tried to write both above and below. And uh, writing about Southeast Asia as a whole is is part of my way of saying actually these things are all fluid and and, and comparative and so forth. Um, so. Um, I, well, but one has to also to say that in, the, in my academic lifetime, history has also become much less prominent a, an academic discipline. So although we have a, a, as, as much interest in the past, I think, as ever, popularly, I mean, we, we love these historical movies and, and sitcoms and so forth. Um, but um, many fewer students, are, a small proportion of, of students actually take it up. It's partly because there are lots of options now, there are, and there are lots of studies uh, and, and uh, all kinds of things like gender studies and, and uh, environmental studies, and, and, and you know, all, the, all the new things have, have emerged as well as new disciplines. Um, and, it's um, the, the role of history as the, the key to understanding ourselves or, or, or the world is, is much diminished now. Um, and it, sometimes, I think you, you mentioned postmodern, you know, modernism and postmodernism. I think that's, that's something we've all lived through. And in a way, Modernism, I mean, we, we, we don't talk of ourselves as modernist history historians, but, but in a way, Marxism was a kind of uh, an arch modernism of, uh, it was trying to be intensely rational and, and intensely uh, predictive of, you know, history is a science, we can tell you what the conditions are for a revolution and so forth. And as long as, as long as Marxism was alive and and the idea of revolution was still a kind of option, something that people talked about, then history seemed to matter. Um, and of course, um, even if, you know, the, the Marxists got it wrong, and, uh, and some of them, of course, got it very crudely wrong, but others, um, you know, gave us a lot of food for thought. Uh, it, it, it kept that, that issue on the agenda of, you know, well, what, under what circumstances would one want a revolution or could one imagine one, like the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution, uh, these things. Um, that seems to be much less now. And in that sense, Fukuyama might have been right in saying, you know, this is the death of history once there's no more Marxism. Um, whether that was, um, uh, I mean, it is, um, in a way, Marxism is making 
a strange comeback in China that nobody really thought was possible. Um, but I don't see that having any influence really on, on intellectual life anywhere else. I don't think it's, uh, it, it is constraining you know, discussion in China quite a lot and uh, surprises one out. But it, um, I, I, um, so, uh, the you know, uh, uh, regarding to this, uh, uh, as I continue to this question, sure, um, as a British historian, uh, Edward uh, Carr uh, defines history as dialogue uh, between history um, today and the historical phenomena in the past, of course. Right. So uh, uh, we can add something to this statement uh, to the late Carr. Um, history as an object and the historian as a subject and this dialogue going on but at the same time, the roles can be changed. Uh, I think there's a uh, history became an object and history become, uh, becomes a uh, subject to give direction to this uh, dialogue. Right. And you emphasize in this uh, early session that the nation states um, created their own um, the history um, uh, to some extent or larger uh, 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 created at the same time blocks uh, between the nation state history and the early stages. And plus uh, in the context of Southeast Asia, there are multi-ethnicities uh, because of particular this insular region, uh, different, uh, the, 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 the different uh, communications uh, throughout this um, archipelago. Um, how this dialogue uh, successfully um, um, uh, structured or, uh, by the historians uh, uh, in, in, in contemporary era. Mm. Should we need to develop uh, this dialogue, the level of dialogue or, or what? Your opinion, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, undoubtedly, historical um, passions and, and interests change as society changes. So, I mean, we, we the, the move away from the state as the main or almost sole actors in, in history um, is in part, part of the, the sort of democratization of, of society, which requires a democratization. So we're now interested in what women, you know, how do you put women into history when, you know, they didn't, write so much in those days, they didn't, you know, were not written about so much. And hi history has always privileged the written record. Um, and so uh, the fact that, I mean, they, they didn't show up so much, meant it's, it's a challenge, but not only women, of course, uh, ordinary folks of, of every kind of literate people, people in Asia and Southeast Asia, the, the people, of course, the people who, people without a, um, a state became the people without history. So people who, who um, like Batax or Karen or you know the, or so many hill peoples who who never thought they needed a state and um, you know Jim Scott has been very articulate about this but I, I I'm on the same uh, I don't go as far as him but I'm on the same sort of wavelength and we've talked about it a lot um, you know statelessness was a was a choice but but it it's kind of means that if you didn't have a state you didn't have a history. And, um, you know, uh, I have written a bit about the, the, the Bataks in Sumatra. I wrote one piece saying, do the Bataks have a history? Because they didn't have a state. And, you know, there are Batak intellectuals who try to invent a state. They try to sort of maximize the, 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 the local leaders and who were essentially religious figures uh, to say, yes, they were kings, rajas, and, and you know. And I think, oh, why do you, well, what makes you so anxious to, to have a state? Surely your achievement is to have had a high civilization, and a system of writing and, um, and of uh, complex ritual. And, and so to have all of this without a state is, is quite an achievement um, that you should be proud of, it, especially in this modern era. But um, certainly you do, um, you know, we are all trying to write about the common human being um, and find new ways of doing that, which, which fits with our democratic age. Um, 
but that's not, that's by no means the whole story. Um, I, I suppose that, you know, the successful historian, like the successful person in every field, is the one who gets lucky in choosing a topic, you know, a, a topic that somehow just hits a, uh, a little mood that's, that's thinking, yes, I mean, th this is the way to go. This is, this is a new way of thinking about things. Um, but in, in general, that, there has been that, uh, that move away from uh, the state as the central actor, but without quite knowing what to put in this place. Um, so that there are, it, it depends what we are, what society is currently obsessing about. And um, I mean, for a time and uh, certain people, it, it seemed to be obsessing about gender issues. And, and so, the, you know, there has been some interesting writing about that. Um, it's now, let's say in Australia, um, becoming very uh, obsessive about indigenous issues, about the Aborigines, and how we can, um, we can write a, a history that does justice to them. As it, typically, people without state and therefore without history, how do you then bring them uh, into prominence um, without violating um, um, uh, historical sort of sense of, of, of truth and, and uh, validity. Um, uh, and every crisis, I suppose, does does produce a new need for, for a history of this. You know, how do we get into this mess, this particular mess? If, if um, um, there was a time with British history, famous Whig history, where, and the Americans have, have uh, a version of Whig history, I'm not sure what they call it, which, which sees the, the expansion of liberty as being the theme. I mean, that that this is what history is about, that we're, we're advancing towards a more democratic and more open and more. Um, that's, not, um, that's not flying at the moment. I mean, depressingly, I, I, I like that kind of history rather more. I mean, the, the notion that you can find something, uh, I mean, gay history might be, a, an example, you know, it, for thousands of years, or at least hundreds of years, you know, homosexuals were oppressed and, and, and marginalized and demonized and so on, punished, and now suddenly they're okay. And so it, it, it is timely to write a new kind of history that, you know, gives them their due. Um, but quite difficult to write, quite challenging. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think it's had a lot of mileage, but, but Contemporary, when I go to conferences now, uh, there is an awful lot of talk about sexuality. Um, that's, I don't think it's, it's um, contributing as much as it might to enlightenment. Um, I mean, uh, but certainly, I mean, of course you're right that the, uh, or Carr is right, that we all live in, in the present and use the past to serve our purposes. Um, my, my hope for history as a profession is that is, is in a sense honest history above all, honest, balanced, globally, globally responsible history um, that can be a corrective to the, the extremes of um, nationalism or religious fundamentalism uh, or, or um, uh, just errant stupidity that uh, um, all societies seem to get themselves into. But that's not a very, perhaps a very, um, what's, what should we say, heroic role. I mean, but I, mean, I feel that uh, maybe I'm the last, you know, that, that, that uh, um, 
I'm not sure if that's what's inspiring the young these days. I'm not quite sure what is inspiring the young. Okay. You probably know better. Okay. Uh, uh, the, great, uh, the, the time is running. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't want to make you much tired. Uh, probably a few more questions. Um, uh, very short answers, uh, if you sure. like. Um, when we look at the history, uh, either Southeast Asia or uh, in the other parts of the world, um, the historians, particularly starting from this uh, analysis in France uh, by the leadership of Fernand Braudel, uh, develop a certain certain perspective uh, and the methodology looking at the long dream uh, perspective, uh, not just one uh, single phenomenon in the historical uh, mm -hmm. process, but connected, uh, successively uh, connected uh, in each other uh, cause and effect relationships, probably we can say in this term. Uh, you have also, uh, I think this is called a masterpiece uh, among your works, the Southeast Asia in the Age of Commerce. 15, uh, 14, 50, 16, uh, uh, 80, two volumes. And uh, historians, like I mentioned, Fernand Bradel and his students, uh, Henry Prierney, Halil Inalji in Turkey, and Sally Hosbaran, uh, did well this concept of economy and, uh, and the economic relationships in the relevant societies. Um, um, of course, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, the concept of capitalism in the long terms of Mediterranean and the Ottomans uh, in its own context. So when we look at your works or the similar ones in Southeast Asia, uh, can we say that there are some uh, sort of uh, um, similarities uh, in terms of economic interactions when we look at the, uh, the longer uh, periods? Uh, yes, welcome. You mean globally or around Eurasia, you mean that, that there's um, uh, commonalities that are broader than the Mediterranean that uh, affect uh, um, the whole of Eurasia, perhaps. I mean, this is. Uh, uh, this is I, th I think there, there, there is something in that. I, I, I do think that um, that one. I mean, my age of commerce was designed for Southeast Asia, and I think it's most uh, apt for that. But you know, there's lots of uh, senses in in which this makes a certain sense. Um, the the long 16th century, let's say, the, the the period from well, the period of what I call the age of commerce, but it's it's in the 16th century you had the massive expansion of silver, which fueled the the world economy. So there was a kind of expansion uh, of trade um, and, and often spectacular amounts of money being being accumulated here and there, um, and not just the, the the stuff from Peru and Mexico, but but also from Japan, um, and it, so it, it, it had a massive effect in China and India also. Um, and I, another thing that, you know, well, I mean, economically, that's where I would tend to. I mean, I tend to be perhaps enough of a little Marxist background in my training to think that if you're looking for a fundamental explanation of why things are similar, why major changes take place, that maybe the economics is the, is the substructure that, 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 that gives rise to that. And, and, and this business about uh, silver and the stimulus to, to, to global trade and so forth might be, might be something to do with that. Um, um, there's also a, I mean, I, I, I talk about, now the early modern period, as I mean, there's a sort of movement to use that term as more uh, less Eurocentric than most of the other terms, like about Renaissance or Age of Discovery or whatever, to simply call it early modern. And I I now see that period of early modernity as as two distinct patterns, two distinct phases which you know, I, I only argue about Southeast Asia, but I think it does make some sense beyond Southeast Asia. And certainly in Japan, for example, um, where you have an initial phase, which is more like my age of commerce of, of encounters where uh, things are very expensive and, and discoveries are being made. People are discovering each other and borrowing from each other in a quite uh, frenzied way. Um, and, you know, of course, there's a Columban exchange, all those 
potatoes and tomatoes and things that came out of America and influenced uh, the rest of the world, the tea that came out of China and all that, but um, also manners of, of, of doing things. And then it's followed from the mid 17th century by a period of what I call vernacularization or consolidation, where in fact, these, uh, I mean, the, the global influences, uh, the external influences uh, go a bit sour. Um, the, the economic base is, is largely <coughs> removed. <coughs> and um, and, and um, the foreign example loses its, uh, its glitter, its, its, uh, its appeal. And so you have consolidations of cultures. So, I mean, I, I, I think that th that is a, a rhythm that makes some sense, sort of sense throughout Eurasia. Um, but I'm never going to argue that. I'll just I'll stick to arguing my, my Southeast Asian case. Uh, another interesting thing, which I think affects um, the Ottomans uh, and and the the Habsburgs and and you know the Tudors and and the the French kings, is this theatrical nature of kingship. I mean, that's that's a very 17th century thing, and it's really spectacularly the case in in Southeast Asia, but I mean, it, it, it hasn't been much um, commented on, except that when Clifford Geertz wrote the book about uh, Bali, which he called, did he call it the theater state? No, he called it Nagara. Well, Nagara, perhaps the theater state was the subtitle. Anyway, that was the catchphrase that suggested the Southeast Asian state especially as exemplified, but it was all about performance. Um, it wasn't about legality or military power. Or, you know, what kings did is perform. And um, it, it was taken up a bit in, in Southeast Asian circles, uh, notably by myself, but it made a much bigger splash in Europe. I mean, European historians thought, yes, that's exactly what, I mean, he's describing very well in, in beautiful uh, anthropological terms, what we want to say about the cloth of the field of gold, you know, the, the sort of amazing performances kings had to make on entry into a city or when a, a royal marriage is going to take place or a coronation or something. It's, it's a huge performance and, and it, 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 it establishes kingship. And I mean, Geertz was saying, you know, was making a stronger case, which he could about Bali, that you know, that's what the state is. It's not, it, it is the performance. Uh, that's when it, it commands attention and respect. And, 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 and I, I have thought that often, especially in Bali, where you go to these huge ceremonies and, uh, you know, I asked, asked Balinese who are in the procession, why do you do that? You know, because nobody's paying you to spend a lot of time in the, 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 the spectacular funeral procession of, of some prominent person, usually a, a Raja, or these days it can be an official, um, or somebody with a lot of money. And I mean, it's interesting, they sort of, well, that's what we do. I mean, they want to say it's reciprocal, you know, we support them and they patronize us. But what they patronize us with, I mean, as I said, well, what do you really get out of it? What you get out of it is glitter, is, is buzz, pizzazz, you know, a sense that Wow, there's something here. It's, I mean, again, a Geertz phrase, making inequality enchant. You know, when you're sort of in love with your king when he can do this, you know, we can put it on this. But it's something about the early modern period. Now, why, why is that there in the 17th century? And I think it's there and it, with, the, with the Ottomans too, but I, I'm not no expert on that, um, where it, it isn't a century or two later. Um, I don't know, but it's... Uh, there are all these broader parallels, and, and uh, I love history that uh, can suggest these, these things that uh, undermine a little bit the uniqueness that uh, we're apt to try to impose on our favoured subject or our own, our own story. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, Not really a uh, short answer. I have some few, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I have some few more questions, but I wish to uh, be more uh, uh, democratic to give some sounds to uh, what's to uh, audience. Uh, uh, 
a uh, few questions coming. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, read the questions. Um, the first one is about uh, uh, regarding to Indonesia, uh, the religious populism. Um, the question is how the Malay identity during the rising tide of religious populism in Indonesia on this era, how Malay to take the opportunity since Malay always labeled as lazy community or in parentheses, myth of Malay. Uh, so is this really a question about Indonesia or about Malaysia? Um, uh, religious populism uh, in Indonesia, but it is also mentioned Malay identity means that sort of combination of uh, uh, the anthropological term Malay, probably, I think, and not the <laughs> Malaysian. Uh, I, I mean, these seem like two different things to me. Uh, the lazy, I mean, it's lazy Malay, but lazy native in general. I mean, that's, uh, of course, a well-established phenomenon in Southeast Asia, but not only in Southeast Asia, that, you know, um, European and Chinese employers who, who, who came in and tried to build corporations and so forth tended to not employ indigenous uh, people as much as foreigners or uh, Chinese or minorities or something. Um, I mean, for, you know, I, I mean that's that's a well-established uh, trope, if you like, and and I don't need to go into that. I mean, of course, greatly exaggerated, but but there's something in the um, uh, stereotype of, of of how the dynamics work between different communities. But um, I, I I'm not sure what that has to do with religious populism. What, what I suppose what I would, I mean, maybe I'm old fashioned in this, a little bit Weberian, who of course, Weber thought hard work and uh, capitalist ethic and so forth was all about religion, that uh, it was your religion, it was the, the Protestant ethic the, 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 that made um, Holland and England and, and, and America especially, uh, into great capitalist uh, powerhouses, that, that sort of discipline um, that um, Calvinists especially had. And that's often been partly by Weber himself, but um, others have taken it further, and, and, and including myself to some extent. Um, the, the notion that Islam um, acted as a kind of Protestant ethic uh, that it uh, at, at certain periods in history it allowed the uh, the strict Muslim, especially the the Arab migrant or the Haji who had been to to Mecca and then returned, allowed them to act in what seemed to the popular um, uh, imagining as a miserly, you know, greedy way. Um, you know, a capitalist behavior. Um, well, I mean, uh, to, to generalize grossly, Southeast Asian men weren't supposed to be very um, mean about money. They weren't supposed to bargain about money. I, I had friends who were just hopeless like that. They would, I mean, anything that had to do with money had to be their wives because they, they had to look as if they didn't care about money. And they had to look as if that, you know, we can throw it around and, and gamble it away. And it's almost a, a virtue to gamble it away. Um, so, I mean, in, in Java, it's, you know, it's quoted by anthropologists. I haven't heard a, a Javanese say this, but anthropologists have that, that fellow, he's behaving like a woman or a Chinese. You know, that's, that's how they behave. If they, if they want to accumulate their money and want to be sort of uh, capitalist about it, want to be, uh, you know, build their, their fortune by hoarding money rather than spending it. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think uh, different kind of religious approach, uh, which is associated with middle classes and urban people, 
uh, and which is a, a puritanical kind of religious uh, approach, uh, can be a very great stimulus towards a kind of hardworking, thrifty um, uh, attitude. I, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that this kind of argument would be quite easy to make in Turkey, but I, I mean, you might tell me I'm wrong. And I, I, I think it, it, um, it, it makes a certain kind of sense in, in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia up to a point. But of course, when, um, when, when um, the, the, the Santri, I mean, the Santri as, as, as Giyats described them, that is the more strict uh, Islamic educated people, are a minority, they can, they can play that role um, and, and become more economically uh, active in, in, in commerce. Uh, when the, the, the whole society becomes um, uh, stricter in Islamic observance, does the whole society then become more um, interested in, in, in accumulating money Maybe, I mean, maybe, but I, I suspect the questioner probably has more data on this than, but there are, there are certainly studies of, of movements in, in Indonesia today uh, of, of religious leaders who promise to make people rich by joining their particular um, movement and their way of life, and, and who in a sense justify this new capitalist, capitalist mentality, which is, Quite different from the mentality of the peasants. Um, so, yeah, I think I think there is something in that. Whether it's religious populism is the word for it, I'm not sure. Okay, um, the, 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 to read the last question coming from our audience um, again. Uh, the person asking, my question is related to the current increasing phenomena, uh, where many societies around the world witness terrible and unfortunate events such as Islamophobia and racism. Most of the actors involved had mentioned something related to historical affairs that inspired the violence. So uh, the question, as, as a historian, what is the best way to deal with the methods of writing history that probably will reduce uh, historical affair? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, as I said, I think we need to be honest. We need to be accurate. We need to be balanced and we need to be global. And uh, I think uh, any um, any history, history that sets out to explore some historical grievance um, should be treated with suspicion. And uh, I mean, this, this is indeed the stuff of um, of dangerous kinds of nationalism and, and uh, racism. Um, the, the idea that my kind of people have been given a hard time by others. Um, and it, it's, it's very alarming that um, this huge country of China is now being led by people who want to maximize that 100 years of humiliation. So uh, we, we're entitled to be angry and, and, and to be uh, nationalist. That's, um, that's a scary kind of history. So I, I, that's what I would just say again, what I said before. I think that's, that's the role of the, of the uh, historian in, in, in being helpful in, in the modern, modern world. I, I do believe you know, profoundly that we need to learn to think of ourselves as a human uh, species who have to cooperate in, in managing this planet and in, in managing um, an orderly uh, way of, of, of dealing with each other. And that is greatly helped if we tell stories honestly and uh, with respect to, to different, different groups. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Reid. Um, I think uh, it's already uh, one hour, uh, 20 minutes. Um, uh, it is too late in Canberra. Uh, I'm very uh, thankful to your uh, kind uh, accounts about history, history, and uh, some sort of relationships happen um, in, in, in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Sardar Reguron, please, welcome.
Thank you so much, Professor, for participating in this webinar in this very early time in Canberra, in Australia right now. You are really so humble. Thank you so much. And thank you for providing many insightful advices, especially about the responsibilities of a historian. I also noted many things, but among uh, all of them, uh, you thought that we should write conscious of how our narratives is. I guess it's really, I mean, something a summary of these responsibilities. And thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. It's a great pleasure. You guys. Okay. Okay. Bye.